Hello there, it's Paul here and welcome along everyone. This is part three on making one of these segmented clocks with a pyrography picture. So the final part is creating an image to go on here and then just glue it into the mount and fixing the actual clock movement. The hardest part is choosing a suitable image. Now for me this time, my daughter has asked if I can do a picture for a friend of an owl that they recently had to have put down because it broke its wing in two places. So I thought it's an appropriate picture and to really cover through the process of how I will hopefully try and get something that looks similar to that onto the board. So this is about the third or fourth clock I've made of these now and I already have a template in Photoshop for where I effectively create all the markings. First thing really was to take this image of the owl that I've got and first of all size it to what I needed to fit in here. And the first job that I usually do on this, there's a filter in Photoshop called Find Edges. And what that does, basically converts your picture to something like that. All as I'm interested in at the moment is to trace on here, really this outline of where the edge of the bird is, the eyes, hopefully somewhere where the beak is, uh, just some form of layout that you can get started with. Once you've got that on there, you can then refer to the picture all the while and then start building up everything that you need to. Now, fur is an absolute nightmare. Uh, it really is. It takes absolutely ages to build up all these lines. So most of this is either going to be time lapse or just small clips of the process because this will take quite a few hours. Always a good idea that you've got several copies of different things, um, especially when you trace over them. If I use this totally to trace over, then ideally I still want something to look back to, to where it is. So I've got my main reference image for the photo. As to this, I've actually got that as well. And I've also got another copy there. The first thing you're going to need to do with your plywood, uh, this is the really thin plywood to fit the clock movement in, is before you even trace your image, you want to sand this back. You want it as smooth as possible. Uh, it may feel quite smooth, but any little bits in there, especially where it's going to catch with the grain, your pyrography tool will just catch on there and you will get all sorts of odd marks. Just got a bit of 600 grit paper here. Uh, you can probably even use old paper that you've used before uh, if it's just going to bring it back smooth. And ideally, you just want to rub it with the grain. Um, and that will just make it a lot smoother. I mean, I can see there, I've just, it probably doesn't show on the camera whatsoever. I've done this top half here. It might show slightly with the coloration, but that now is really a lot smoother. There's lots of different ways you can get your copy of the image onto your work. If you've got a laser printer, if you actually printed this in reverse, you could actually then lay your paper down there and iron it on with some form of heat. Again, if you print it in reverse, you could then go over this with a pencil um, to the point of where even if you just did all that over where you want to do your lines, and then when you went on the other back side, on the other side, then went over fairly hard with your lines, it would then put the pencil onto your image. Uh, the problem with those is that it does require a fair bit of pressure and you may well then start finding that you start denting plywood. When I first started doing the pyrography, I used to use ordinary carbon paper. That can be purchased really, really cheap. The only downside of that is, is that you can't rub it off your work very easily. The best way I have found is with sarrel paper. Now this is expensive stuff. Uh, it's about 12 foot long, with a foot wide. And I think that was somewhere around about the 20 pound mark. So it is quite expensive. You can reuse it again. I know some people don't like to use this because it doesn't really put that deeper lines on your work. So reusing it 
isn't always such a good thing. Now this is very much like carbon paper and it doesn't take a lot of pressure to put your lines on. So if you put it on there, you could even rub it with your finger and you'll find that you'll start getting blue lines on there. Now the, the sharper point or the heavier point you've got will put more defined lines on there. The paper comes in several different colors. Uh, it shows on the box here. I mean, there's gray, white, blue, yellow, and red. The other really good thing about this paper is that it, the lines will just rub out with a normal rubber so that's the real benefit because ideally you don't want to leave those lines on there now the first thing i'm going to do is with this one is actually cut out my circle here uh, it doesn't have to be precise it's just a case that when i lay it on the work i'm going to be able to see how it sits in relation to the edges to make sure it fits okay So I've left a slight board around it rather than cutting too close to the edges and I can then see on there how it's going to sit. Always a good idea at this point to check that your image is going to be the right size to fit in your clock. So I've got my grain direction that I want. I actually want this to go across that way. I've got my image on there where I want it and once you've got your image on there laid out how you want it's best to tape it down on one end. And I'm just using mask and tape here because it will just peel off nice and easily. So it won't affect the work and it won't affect the paper. At this point as well, it's a good idea to put another marking point. I'm not gonna to wanna to trace these numbers at the moment. I'm gonna leave those to last because I'm just gonna concentrate on the, on the actual main subject. So what I've done here, is I've got a piece of tape just underneath the edge of the paper so that when this is taped on here I can put myself a line on the bottom here so that I know every time I lift this up and drop it down again that line should line up. Next job is just trace the image so I'll just place my copying paper under there. That shouldn't be able to move too much from side to side, but to make sure I'm lined up, I've got my line at the bottom there. And it's just a case then of tracing out your main image. Now I have sharpened my pencil just before I started this. And try not to rub your hands too much on this because it will transfer the blue onto your work. Now with an image like this there just isn't too many detail lines and I find that if I can just get this main outline which hopefully will have come through okay it will be enough for me to start working on and that really is a basic outline to start work on. Because I really haven't got much else to copy on here, I could probably just take this off now. Um, but I will pro probably just leave it on the back there. Now for me, with I've got the Peter Child topography machine, and I mean, it does come with just a couple of ordinary pieces. There's the standard ordinary piece of wire, or alternatively you get the shading bit which is a bit like a spoon bit and I tend to prefer to use this on things like this always worthwhile having a similar piece of wood next to you so I've got another piece of plywood switch my machine on it's only on number two at the minute and I can see on there then really how quick the burning comes in And I have found that when you do this, you don't want instant black lines. Um, if you've got it set too high to burn too quickly, then you'll soon ruin the whole image. And I don't know whether you can actually see on there the little bits that I've done. And it's hardly 
attaching the on there so we'll start at that and the other thing as well if you leave your tip off the work like this the heat builds up in there so the moment you put it on there it will let the heat go straight away and you'll usually get more of a scorch mark to start with so what i'm going to do next is probably all the burning of this i will put on time lapse because it's going to take me quite a few hours i will apologize now if there's issues with the image that you can't see properly what i'm doing uh, i will be using my lamp with the magnifying glass on it uh, because i just find it easier for me to work with the main image all traced now i'm starting off with the eyes as they're the obvious place to start as they've got to be so bold and you'll notice here that i am slowly building up the darkness on here it's always best to slowly build it up otherwise you just burn deeply into the wood and make a whole mess of the thing I've only really just put a base level on the eyes, which I'll go back to and make even more darker and put more detail in them. I'm starting to do all the outline, and you'll notice here as I go around, I tend to burn inside the line, and then I'll rub the line out afterwards. Once I've started laying the, the main part of the outline down, I start then trying to add some more detail in. And even at this stage, I really have doubts as to how well the image is going to turn out. Another good reason for doing light burning marks as well is that if you find that you've made a mistake it is then possible to try and sand some of the burnt areas out. Now if you go too deep then you've got really no chance of sanding those out to, to rectify any mistakes. I've had images in the past where it wasn't until I'd got all the, the remaining detail in that I was actually happy with it and there has been times where I've almost given up on the image because I just thought it was never going to work out. Doing fur really does take a lot of time and you'll see that I'm constantly flipping the, the shading tool here over from using the flat spade area for putting shade in to the sharp edge to do all the fur and put finer detail lines in. You can also see here that I've got the original photograph that I'm constantly looking at for where I need to build up the areas. And on an image like this, you're really, I'm really looking for all the dark areas to start with on how to build it all up. And as time goes by and you get more and more in, the image really does start to come to life and really does make it a lot more pleasing to do. I could really have probably gone over this another couple of times to put a lot more contrast in it to give it that bit much more of an impact. The main image is all done now and it's go back and trace all the numerals on. You really want a sharp pencil for this part of the job as you really want some good defined lines because there are so many straight edges on here. Also with the pattern I'm using here you'll see that there are an awful lot of thin lines as well. And rather than trying to trace out the entire line, I find it's actually easy, easier to just trace one part of the line. And at least when you start doing the burning work, you can then fill the rest in. I also pay special attention to make sure that everything is straight as well. So for example, the tops and bottoms, the numerals all line up. And I always start off using the edge of the sh shading tip there because it's got such a fine edge. Once I've got all the main outline in I will then flip over to the shading side of the tool to fill in the areas where I can and there are times that you have to tip it up on end so that you can get into the narrow edges. So I've finished with the image now and what I did do as well was I went then redid a black and white photograph because it was actually a lot harder to try and follow with the colour. I mean, I do have a lot of these lines in here, which could have probably been a little bit darker, create a bit more contrast, but I am really happy with that result. So next job is have your clock movement ready. This one is a 7.5mm thread. So hopefully with a 7.5mm drill bit, it should have enough clearance. Thank you. 
The good thing about this is it will have a washer over the front. I'm going to just give this a coat of sanding sealer. Uh, and the reason for that is that when I give this a coat of spray lacquer, I don't really want the grain bubbling up too much. I'd rather deal with that now. I will just give that a gentle rub over with the 600 grit paper. Now I just use ordinary wood PVA glue. If your disc isn't fully tight with the inside, you just need to check that you've got things lined up nicely. It's always a good idea to just put a mark on the back. So that's going to be my top. Now you might find that your plywood is a little bit bent and it's not sticking everywhere around so either you'll need to clamp it or stick a weight on the back until it's dry so the glue is all now set it's the following day and i will just re-sand around the edge here just to tidy it up just to get rid of any rough edges Right, that's now ready for a finish and I will just use a clear gloss lacquer. For ease, what I've also done as well is because we've already got a hole in the centre, I created a little stand with a bolt in the size for the hole. Just leave the nut on because you don't want it dropping down too far and that can go on there. And the good thing is you can spray one side and because you're it's dry underneath you can put your hand in underneath and rotate it around just slowly work my way around making sure i get all the edges around the outside here and for the other side make sure i get in that inner rim and then just turn it around a little bit And the other good thing about doing it on a stand like this is at least you can pick it up easy enough and just move it. And I mean, that is probably showing a slight shine to it at the minute. I don't know whether it shows on the camera or not, uh, but that will dull down as it dries uh, and it will soak into the wood a bit. So that's the first coat done. So I'll come back when I've finished it all. I gave this two coats of spray lacquer, left it to fully cure I think it was about two days before I came out again I then sanded the whole lot back gently to with 600 grit paper again just so it got a nice smooth finish and then just gave it one more coat of the spray lacquer and it has come up really really nicely the other thing I've also done off camera for ease of mounting this now you'll find that a lot of these movements will come with a little hanging hook like that but you've got to remember they're going to be sat in on the back there so unless you've got a long hook or end up tying a bit of string to it it's going to be hard to hang it some of these also don't come with this bit the hanger bit so that it will just be the actual square part of the movement so you've got no way of hanging them so as an extra what i've done is i got a piece of oak and i measured the angle for which this slopes in set the angle 
on my bench sander to represent that angle and then I could slowly just take out the shape of the curve keep checking it on here I've also drilled a hole right through from this side so that if you've got a nail in the wall you want to hang it on at the same time as well if you've got a hook or you even you want to put a bit of string on there I've drilled a hole up from the bottom so assembly wise your movement rubber washer on the back poke her through the front on with a little brass washer which is here it just cuts covers up that tear out you you might get and on with the nut I will usually use a socket set just with your hands only at least that way you're not gonna over tighten up our hand goes on first the important thing about these is that these are really really flimsy uh, if they've got shape like this they have usually got a lot more strength to them if they're like them the second hand which is one really thin piece of tin I presume they bend really really easily so stick them on a flat surface make sure they're fully flat and just gently try and straighten them out with the hands it's just a case of pushing them on a couple of thumbnails but they just need a firm pressure and always try and push down round either side of that ring because then you won't risk bending this all out of shape again and then on with the second hand now not all clocks come with a second hand it's choice when you buy them this is usually quite firm just push it on there now i hope you've enjoyed the series it's been three parts basically because there's been so much involved in doing these I think this is probably about the fifth or sixth clock like this I've done so far. So the really part one went all over preparation, uh, what to buy, the little pitfalls and things to look out for, uh, to cutting all, all the wood, and then also doing all the glue up for the segmented part. The second part was all the turning on the lathe, which as you'll see, isn't really much at all. And the, this third and final part was all about your picture selection, uh, little things to look out for, pyrography, and then the final assembly. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you on the next project video.